Okay, okay, hold on now, hold on. So this is your son, you said? It's my son. Okay, what's his name? Tyler Honeycutt. Imagine being blessed at birth with perfect height for the sport you'd end up falling in love with. Imagine by the time you're a high school senior, you're one of the best players in the country at your position and have the unique opportunity to choose from pretty much any of the top schools in the country to attend college, including one of the most coveted, prestigious, and winningest college basketball franchises in history that just happens to be right down the street from where you grew up in UCLA. Now imagine attending that school and playing so well that by your sophomore year, you have the chance to leave school early for the best basketball opportunity in the world that every kid that plays, dreams, works, and prays nightly to make it to, the NBA. You get drafted to that league and guess what? You have the chance to play in your home state for a team that really needed help at the time. Fast forward and imagine losing all of that and now being in a position in life where you feel like you have no other options any longer but to die. You're at the edge of the bed, gun in hand, mind racing, and one single thought all too clear and moving in slow motion. Put the gun to your head. Pull the trigger. It could all be over right now. A better experience awaits on the other side. No way out. This is where today's feature, Tyler Dion Honeycutt, on July 15th, 1990, was on July 7th, 2018. Now clear your mind. Don't pull the trigger. Whatever's on the other side isn't worth the people you leave behind remembering you as a person that got so low mentally, so defeated, weakened, that you couldn't fight another day. Rest in peace to Tyler and may his family find the ways to deal with this tragic ending to such a talented player who at just 27, 28 had so much more life to live. It's your boy JC Stunning Growth. Let's get it. Honeycutt was a 6'8 small forward from Silmar, California. He was frequently compared to Tayshawn Prince as an amateur, but in my opinion, he had way more game than Prince and couldn't have asked for better opportunities than he got throughout his basketball career. The definition of a slasher that could also shoot it from deep, mid-range, or finish above the rim on drives. But things didn't exactly go his way on the basketball floor at the levels he wanted them to, and here's why I think that was and also what may have led to him taking his own life. Stunt number one, leaving school early. In high school, Tyler was the man at Silmar High and was considered the third best small forward in the class of 2009. He had offers from schools like USC, Memphis, and UCLA. He eventually chose UCLA as his school of choice because it gave him the opportunity to play and possibly start right away. Also because he could play with players like Malcolm Lee and Reeves Nelson and have a chance to make the NCAA tournament and possibly go all the way. In his first season, the team fell short of the NCAA tournament with a losing record of 14 and 18 to finish the season. He averaged seven points a game and six rebounds in 28 minutes as a freshman and shot 34% from three, being named to the Pac-10 All-Freshman team. In his second season, he and the team got a lot better. He was named first team All-Pac-10 and the team made the NCAA tournament with a 23-11 record. Unfortunately, they would lose in the third round to Florida in a game that went down to the wire. He finished the season averaging 13 points a game, seven rebounds, shot 36% from three, attempting almost five a game in 35 minutes, starting every one. The season didn't end the way he would have liked, but now came a huge decision to make, one that could make or break his career. Leaving early always has its pros and cons. It allows you to keep and use your potential to an advantage on draft night, seeing as youth in basketball is always coveted. It allows you to begin your career sooner, giving you a chance to capitalize on having more years in the league, which means breaking more records and more chances to make more money, 
Not to mention, you can now finally take care of yourself and your family and not have to worry about turning in finals, papers, and homework. But leaving early can also take away your chances to go back to school and play if things don't work out. Leaving early, you're also betting on yourself to not have to look back and focus solely on basketball. If it all works out, then great. If you end up in a situation like the second round with no guarantees, then things get a little dicey, as what happened to Tyler. In my opinion, he should have went back to school for a junior season and pushed for a higher draft spot instead of going 35th in the second round as he did. He obviously needed work on his frame and also could have shown scouts he could score the ball better than 13 points a game. He would have been the best player on the team as a junior and clear first option. Him averaging 17, 18 at UCLA would have been huge especially understanding that Ben Holland's offense traditionally didn't allow players to show their full offensive talent. I think it hurt him landing in the second round where he was eventually traded after just two seasons and 24 games. Stunt number two, unfortunate landing. Some of the biggest cons that comes as a result of leaving early is landing on a team that either doesn't suit your style of play has too many key players at your position, and because you landed in the second round, you're not the focal point of a team's interest. I would say all of these things ended up happening to Tyler. Drafted 35th by the Sacramento Kings in the 2011 draft, although not to a good team, still had pretty much a young roster and some vets directly in his spot. DeMarcus Cousins being the star of the team in just his second year, Tyreek Evans, whom the team still had high hopes for coming off a Rookie of the Year campaign just two seasons previously, Isaiah Thomas, also just a rookie, drafted in the same draft as the last pick looking to solidify himself, Dante Green, Jimmer, Terrence Williams, Garcia, Whiteside, and pretty much every name on the roster were all young and hungry. Honeycutt coming in as a slender framed guy that doesn't do anything exceptional as a second round pick made that landing spot all but the worst place he could have ended up. He just couldn't get footing on his new situation. He would end up spending a lot of time in the D-League and by February 2013 he was traded to the Houston Rockets who gave him a month to get right in the D-League but waived him when he couldn't. His time in Sacramento proved that it's very important where you land in that league, and if you so happen to find yourself in a situation like he did, it could be detrimental to your future. He's been overseas ever since. Who knows, that situation could have been the initial reason his ending turned out to be so tragic in the first place. Having to go overseas where you don't speak the language and don't know who to trust all but kill this once promising talent. Stunt number three, immaturity. I think the final stunt in Honeycutt's growth as a person and as a player came because in hindsight, he wasn't ready to handle the situations he would be in and mostly him having to go overseas. There, he would entangle himself with the wrong crowd instead of focusing on getting back to the NBA. He began using a substance, allegedly nitrous oxide, that according to his family, quote, scrambled his brain, and by the time he came back to the States in 2018, he was paranoid and going through strong withdrawals that finally caught up to him in the summer of that year. Acting violently at home with his mom, he began brandishing weapons and attacking her, also prohibiting her from using the phone to call for help. She was able to get away and immediately call the police, who showed up to the house where he was sitting in the room at the edge of the bed, fully paranoid with three bullets in his handgun. The police did what they could to give him chances to come out and de-escalate the situation, telling him things like you're not in trouble yet, come out and just talk to us so we can make sure things were okay. Feeling attacked and cornered, he made a huge mistake and shot at the officers who took cover with one of them actually inches away from losing his life. An officer began firing back at Honeycutt. At this point, he was now in all the trouble he could be in. 
feeling like the end of the road was near and the standoff getting longer and longer, the officers stormed the home in the early morning and found Tyler laying on the ground with a bullet to his head, apparently self-inflicted. And just like that, it was all over. We can say that he wasn't mature enough to leave school early, or enough to handle being taken by a team that didn't need him, or enough to leave his country and remain focused on the goal while over there. Whatever the real story is, unfortunately, we won't ever know. Going through everything he did takes a lot of strength and maturity, something Tyler just didn't yet figure out. All in all, rest in peace, man. Stories like this are ones you never want to have to do, especially for a guy that was given every opportunity to make it right, even in his last hours. Now his mother has to live with feeling that calling the cops may have escalated that situation and caused her son's death. In my opinion, she did the right thing because that situation could have ended with her or someone close dying instead, seeing as Tyler was committed to firing at anyone that came close. Once again, rest in peace, my condolences, and hopefully the family is doing okay. Sleep well, Tyler.